right, well, let's get started. Um, welcome to yet another event of the Celebration of Women in STEM conference here at GRCC. Um, today, you're going to be treated to a presentation by Dr. Eleanor Gates, um, a support scientist and astronomer who has one of the neatest addresses in the world, Mount Hamilton, California. Um, yes, Eleanor lives on the top of Mount Hamilton, where she is um, a support astronomer at Lick Observatory. And she's going to tell you about her work as an astronomer. Um, I'm Marianne Lassert, and I actually met Eleanor long distance when she became my science advisor for the novel that I'm going to release soon called Base 10. Um, in brief, Eleanor's background, she has a PhD from the University of New Mexico in physics. Um, and one of the things that happened in her lifetime, as far as being in the right place at the right time, is in her previous work, um, she was working in adaptive optics when it was a young fledg fledgling industry. Um, and right pretty much during the completion of a PhD, which those of you who have done a page, PhD could imagine, um, she was hired at Lick Observatory, where she's been for almost 11 years. Um, and one last other interesting piece of information, Eleanor actually has an asteroid named after her. Asteroid 2650 is named Eleanor for her work at the Minor Planet Center. Um, without further ado, here's Eleanor Gates. It's uh, number 2650, uh, and it's named Eleanor. So, yep. So anyway, astronomy is all about studying the universe, and the universe is huge. Um, so it gives us a lot of stuff to look at, a lot of stuff to try and figure out. Um, so I'm going to, you know, talk about how we do astronomy first uh, before I go on a tour of the universe with you. Um, one of the biggest problems with astronomy is that all the stuff is out there. It's not here. So unlike your typical you know, physics laboratory, chemistry laboratory, where you have equipment in hand and you can have samples and measure them under a microscope or something, the universe is out there. And we haven't invented the warp drive. It's not Star Trek. We can't go there, at least not most places. So we are limited predominantly to looking at light. And uh, oh, I should mention, this is where I live and work, Lick Observatory. Um, showing some of the tools of astronomy. Um, our main telescope is right here. That's a three meter diameter telescope. Um, it's situated in the San Francisco Bay Area on the highest peak in the Bay Area. So it's a um, really fabulous uh, place to work. Yeah, every one of these domes has a telescope in it. So you can see it's a very active, but this is the biggest telescope on Mount Hamilton. 
Um, and I'll talk about the, the advantages of big telescopes a little bit. But anyway, our main tool for looking at the universe is light. We're lucky because light actually contains a whole lot of information. Uh, so we can learn a lot just by looking at things. Um, light comes in a whole bunch of different colors. We all know this. We can see with our eyes and see the different colors around us. But that's just a tiny little portion of what we can see is just that. Um, the electromagnetic spectrum, as we call it, um, has a lot of different wavelengths of light. You could go down to radio waves, microwaves, infrared light, which is the light just red of what our eyes can see. Um, and then on the blue end, we have ultraviolet light, which is just blue of what our eyes can see. Uh, we all know ultraviolet light because that's what gives us sunburn. Um, so our sun emits a lot of it. Um, but there's also x-rays and gamma rays out there. And astronomers actually look at light in all its colors to try and figure out what's going on out there in the universe. Uh, we have different types of telescopes to look at these um, sort of things. And not all colors of light actually make it through the Earth's atmosphere. There are some colors of light, like um, the ultraviolet, that for the most part, and gamma rays, that for the most part don't make it through the Earth's atmosphere and we have to send up satellites to see. Um, so from the ground, we're limited to sort of looking at optical light, some radio waves down at the very red end, and um, you know, everything else we have to go to space for the most part. Um, typical telescopes, these are pretty typical looking telescopes. Um, most people, when they think of telescopes, think of telescopes like this one. You know, long tube, an astronomer standing at the end looking through an eyepiece. That's actually not how astronomy is done today. But this telescope is at Lick Observatory. It was the first telescope built there in the 1880s um, by, a, uh, by money given to us by uh, James Lick, hence the name Lick Observatory. Um, this is the three meter telescope, again, our largest telescope, a modern telescope. Uses mirrors instead of lenses to collect and focus the light. Um, in astronomy, we want to see the universe better. So the bigger the telescope, the better you're going to do. The bigger the telescope, the more light you collect. It's like having a bigger eyeball. That means you can see fainter objects or objects that are much further away. A uh, second benefit of big telescopes is that um, you can see smaller details. Um, there are reasons why that doesn't always work in practice, which I may talk about later. Um, but this is for looking at optical light or near-infrared light, essentially what our eyes can see. To look at some other wavelengths, we need things um, like gamma ray telescopes that look very different, uh, the magic gamma ray array. Um, or radio waves, you have these huge, look like big satellite dishes. Um, these guys at the via very large array in New Mexico, um, which I've used for some of my research, um, each one of these dishes is 25 meters across, um, you know, about 75, 80 feet across. They're huge, and there are 27 of them total. We're only seeing some of them. So depending on what color of light you want to look at, you have different tools. Now, one of the things that I do in my research is I actually build telescopes and instruments for telescopes uh, as part of my research, uh, not just looking at the sky. Um, for the most part, once you collect the light with the telescope, you need to detect it and do something with it. So we have things like CCD cameras, which you all know now they're public. Uh, they're in your cell phones, digital cameras. CCD cameras are sort of the same thing. Astronomers were really the first people to use CCD cameras. We started using them in about 1980. And it took about 20 years for the technology to advance to something that we could have for uh, you know, public consumption in our digital cameras. Um, so sometimes we just take pictures with our digital cameras. Uh, sometimes we take the light and make what we call a spectrograph, where we take a prism or diffraction grating, which is essentially a fancy prism, and divide the light up into its various colors. And we can see up here in the spectrum of the sun um, how different colors of light are there, and occasionally you'll see like black bands where color is missing. That missing color tells us interesting information, like what something is made of or how fast it's moving. So we're lucky that light contains all this information, because that's kind of what we're limited to looking at in astronomy. Um, there are a couple exceptions. Um, in astronomy, we do get the occasional piece of space coming to us that we can actually study in a laboratory. Uh, and so we have things like meteorites come and hit the Earth uh, so that uh, we can take those in the lab, look at what it's composed of. Um, occasionally, a Mars meteorite hits us. That's a piece of chunk that was flung off Mars and eventually hit Earth. Uh, yes? Yeah, you have to study it and look at the chemical composition. Okay. It's tricky. It's really tricky. But we know it's not from Earth because it has a different com chemical composition of Earth, and it has a different composition from uh, your regular meteorites. Um, and of course, 
the moon is the one place outside of the Earth where people have actually been. And of course, we had astronauts uh, come and bring moon rocks back. So those are things we can study in the laboratory. Pretty limited. Um, there's another thing that we can do. Hello, move forward. Yeah. Um, so we do get particles from space as well, things called cosmic rays and neutrinos. Now, believe it or not, right this second, there are lots of cosmic rays and neutrinos streaming through your body. They just go right through the Earth for the most part. But every once in a while, they interact and cause phenomena such as the aurora borealis, which is very pretty. Um, other things, uh, such as neutrinos, um, they interact with matter on Earth very rarely. So we have to build huge detectors to see them. And so Super Kamiokande is a detector in um, Japan for looking at neutrinos. They hope that a neutrino might hit one of the molecules of water in this detector and create a flash of light. So all these little uh, round things are actually d light detectors. And that little raft there has two little guys in it. So you can see how big this detector is. Um, and it's going to be totally full of water uh, once they start operating it. Those little bulbs, um, they're, they're uh, what's called photomultiplier tool, tubes. Essentially, they're really, really sensitive to light. So if a single light photon hits it, um, you, you'll, you'll, you'll detect it. And they can tell which direction the neutrino came from by which one of these little bulbs detects the light. Anyway, it's hugely complicated because there aren't that many neutrinos out there. But they do come to us here on Earth, which is sort of the exception in astronomy. And cosmic ray detectors, we have things like these. We call them schmooze um, that, that also detect uh, things coming to us from space. So I've, I've talked so much about the uh, technology involved and how we detect things and what we have available to us to study in astronomy. Um, but there's another thing is occasionally we do go out to space. So we have things like the Hubble Space Telescope above the Earth's atmosphere that allows us to look at the sky um, at some of the wavelengths that don't make it through the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, so we also send the occasional probe out in space, like the Galileo Space Probe. We sent that up. It's flown by um, Jupiter, taking pictures of a bunch of its moons. Um, we're still essentially looking at light, but at least we're getting a closer up view. Uh, that we wouldn't necessarily be able to get otherwise. Um, Stardust was a neat satellite that was sent up, went to fly through a comet's tail, and then came back to Earth. Other than go astronauts going to the moon and getting moon rocks, this is the only time that I know of that we've gone out to space, gotten some material, and then brought it back to the laboratory. Um, and then, of course, we have the Mars rovers that are rolling around on Mars as we speak, doing soil samples, taking pictures and stuff. So, but we're limited. All these things are very close to us. Um, the universe is way larger than where our, our space probes have gone. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about astronomers, now that I've talked about some of the tools and what we actually detect. Um, and this is, uh, there are sort of three types of astronomers. There are observationalists. We're the ones that use the tools, that take the pretty pictures, analyze the data, figure out how something's moving, what it's made of, um, what its history is. Uh, so this is usually what people think of astronomers. They think of taking these pretty pictures of galaxies or what have you. Um, theorists do the deep thinking. They're the ones that truly understand the mathematics and the physics behind things. They will sit there and ponder deep thoughts about what happens inside a black hole, things that maybe we can't necessarily observe. Uh, but a good theorist will say, ah, I have this theory. We can prove it b by making this sort of observation. And then the observationalist will say, OK, let's measure it and see if the theory is correct or not. Um, and then we have the instrumentationalists. And uh, I'm an instrumentationalist primarily, so this talk is a little instrumentation heavy, I will admit. Um, but they're the people that build and design the telescopes and instruments. Now, most astronomers aren't purely a theorist or aren't purely an observationalist. They actually um, are combined. So I do instrumentation. I also do a fair bit of observation using the tools I've built and the telescopes I've built. Um, I don't do so much theory, but all observational astronomers have to know enough about the theories to understand them or, or come up with reasons why their observations don't match the theories that have been proposed um, in case they don't confirm a theory. So uh, astronomers, most astronomers, are observationalists. And all, almost all observationists also do a little bit of theory. Um, all observationalists must understand the instrumentations they're using. So you can see it's very interdisciplinary. You can't just you know, focus in on one tiny aspect of astronomy and ignore the rest, because then you won't quite understand what you're doing. So who are astronomers? 
So these cartoons pretty much show the typical stereotype. Some white guy, older, in a white lab coat, staring through a telescope. Um, that's not your typical astronomer. Astronomers do not usually use their eyeballs to look through a telescope. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a much more diverse group of that. This next picture is a group of students from UC Berkeley who work on discovering supernovae explosions uh, with uh, Alex Filipenko, one of the faculty members there. I work with most of these students up at the observatory. You'll see, you know, mostly white guys. Let's face it, still a white dominated science, uh, a white guy dominated science, but you'll see a couple girls there, a couple guys of minority groups. Um, it's getting better with time as more and more women, more and more role models are out there. Um, you'll see a typical evening at the telescope at Lick Observatory, a bunch of people crowding the telescope control room. Uh, pretty typical to have four or five people in there. You know, you'll see two ladies out of, you know, a, a group of six people. Not a bad ratio, about, you know, 30% women. That's fairly typical in astronomy. <laughs> right, yeah, I'm happy to answer questions. So, anyway, of course, in astronomy, there's no reason why it shouldn't be 50 50. So, we've got a friend of mine, Shelley Wright, who does astronomy, and I, I don't know who this other fellow is that's working with her at the telescope. Um, most astronomers actually sit in front of computers all day because all the cameras and all the instruments are computer controlled. So, you take a picture and it shows up on your computer screen just like it does with the digital cameras uh, for the most part. Um, but there's no reason why in astronomy you can't have a 50-50 ratio that women to men, and that's what we're aiming for. But we're not there yet. So I've already talked about the three sort of classes of astronomers, uh, instrumentationalists, theorists, and, and instrumentalists. But there are lots of different fields of astronomy. As astronomy, the universe is so huge, you can't really focus on everything. There's just not enough time in anyone's day. So astronomers usually classify themselves by what sorts of astronomy they do. So they can either classify themselves by the sorts of objects they look at, uh, such as the sun for solar astronomy or the solar system for looking at planets, asteroids, comets, um, stellar astronomy where you're looking at stars, galactic astronomy where you're looking at objects inside our ga galaxy, or extragalactic where you're looking at objects outside of our galaxy. Um, these are very broad classifications and they all have their su little subspecialties. Um, sometimes astronomers are classified based on what sort of astronomy, what, what interdisciplinary field they are. So you have astronomers, you also have astrobiology, astrochemistry, um, astrophysics, where you're actually using the, the tools of another physical science to explain the, the universe. Um, astrobiology covers things like searching for planets around other stars and do they, are they like Earth? Would they be habitable? Would there be life out there? Um, and things like that. Whereas astrochemistry is about the, um, you know, how chemicals form in space. Uh, astrophysics, of course, how things move. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, lot of stuff. Um, or some people are classified by the type of wavelength or material they're looking at. You know, oh, I only do optical astronomy. I mean, I just look at light that our eyes can see, or I just do gamma ray astronomy, or just look at the particles streaming to us from space. Um, so most astronomers actually fit in multiple ca categories. Myself, I do astrophysics. I also do extragalactic astronomy. I've done some stellar astronomy. I've looked at radio, optical infrared, um, some gamma ray astronomy. So that most astronomers span multiple fields. But you can't do it all. There's just the universe is too big. Um, so now we're going to go on a short tour of the universe and uh, some of the interesting things out there that are pretty and interesting to study because we don't understand anything completely yet. There's still a lot in astronomy we don't know. So we're going to start with the sun. The sun is the nearest star to the earth. Um, it's the source of all our light, um, source of all our heat. Um, and this is the sun not as we see it with our eye, but uh, the picture on the um, your um, left. <laughs> can't tell left from right on my best days, um, it shows the sun in ultraviolet light. Looks much different from that plain orange sphere that we see. You can see prominences sticking out the side. That's huge eruptions on the surface of the sun, spew particles out through space. In fact, a lot of our cosmic rays that hit the Earth's atmosphere and that we detect here on Earth are actually spewed out by the sun in these huge um, eruptions on the surface. Um, if we go and look at x-rays, you can see bright spots here um, that are probably other explosions on the surface of the sun, generating more uh, particles as well. But depending on the color of light you look at with the sun, 
Um, you can tell different things about the physics going on inside the sun. Nuclear fusion is in there, uh, melding helium, uh, merc uh, say the right thing, hydrogen atoms into helium and then helium atoms into heavier elements such as uh, oxygen and carbon and stuff. Um, so there's all sorts of interesting physics there. We don't understand the sun very well. And it is our closest star, so by understanding the sun, we have a chance of understanding other stars in the universe much better. At least that's what we hope. So moving a little farther out, we have the solar system. So the solar system, most of us are familiar with solar system objects, uh, things such as the moon, which is there nicely on every slide of my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, we have asteroids. Uh, this is a picture of asteroid Gaspara which is uh, a relatively large one that we actually sent a space probe by, so we got these lovely high resolution pictures. Uh, comets, um, Comet Lulin is in the sky right now. If you have binoculars or a small telescope, you'll be able to see it. Um, if you look in the constellation, it's either um, Leo or Cancer in the right place. Um, Jupiter, biggest planet in our solar system. Um, we have nine major planets, well actually eight major planets since they downgraded Pluto to being the biggest dwarf planet. Uh, I've got to adjust my thinking. It's, it's still not natural to me to, to say only eight major planets. Uh, but Jupiter is the biggest of our planets in the solar system. It has four major moons discovered by Galileo in uh, about 400 years ago. And in fact, I should take it aside since I mentioned Galileo. Uh, this year, 2009, is the International Year of Astronomy. Uh, celebrating the, the four, it's uh, 400 years after Galileo first used a small telescope to look at the heavens. Um, and he discovered these four moons uh, very soon afterwards. Uh, and also this year is the 50th anniversary of our largest telescope at Lick Observatory. Um, so there's a bunch, if you look in newspapers and stuff around the country, there are special astronomy related events uh, associated with the International Year of Astronomy to celebrate uh, 400 years of the telescope. Uh, but anyway, these, these four moons of Jupiter, very big moons, um, orbited around Jupiter. Galileo s essentially used it to prove that um, uh, the, uh, sorry, get having a hard time getting the words out. Um, you know, that, that not everything orbits around the sun, that there can be orbits around other things. Um, and then Saturn, another large planet in our s solar system. Um, it has these lovely rings around them, composed mostly of ice particles. Um, you'll see gaps in the rings. These little gaps are caused by moonlets. Uh, Saturn has lots of little moons, and the moons uh, keep the rings in order, we think. Theorists are actually trying to figure out exactly the physics of how this works and how we have these lovely rings stay stable for so long. Um, you know, observationalists look at them and try and figure out by watching it and how they change over time um, how the physics is working. So all this is interdisciplinary. Um, stellar astronomy. I don't have lots of pictures of individual stars because stars are far away. They just look like points of light except for our sun, which is close to us. But stellar astronomers look at um, single stars, look at, say, the star's color. You'll see I have this nice plot. I'm not going to go into the, the plot in detail except to say that different stars is, of different sizes show up in different places on this plot. Um, they're different colors. Our sun is sort of a medium-sized star. It's yellow. It sort of sits there in the middle of the plot. Um, it's just it's a Joe average star. Um, but sometimes you find uh, stars in binary groups. I've got this little animation going showing two stars orbiting around each other. Sometimes it's more complicated. Sometimes you'll have three. Sometimes you'll have five. You might have you know, eight or more stars all orbiting around each other in very complicated ways. A lot of times we'll only see one star. And then if we look at it with a spectroscope, um, uh, and we'll see that there are multiple stars orbiting around each other. Uh, so with the right equipment, you can discover things you wouldn't be able to see with a regular telescope. And some stars are variable. They change in brightness over time. Sometimes they change in brightness because they're changing size. Sometimes they have huge star spots on them that are um, cooler than the rest of the sun, change the brightness as the star, star spot rotates around to the front of the star, the star will get fainter, and that rotates behind the star will get brighter. Um, all these things that take that we can discover about stars. Um, stars usually don't come in singles. They're usually forming groups. So we have star clusters. We have, I have two pictures I've taken here of star clusters. Um, M11 is an open cluster. These are young stars. Open clusters tend to have on the order of 10 to hundreds of stars in them. Uh, they, very young stars tend to be blue in color, hotter. Hotter stars are blue. Um, and then we have globular clusters. This is a cluster M15. 
Um, these tend to have our oldest stars. They're very dense clusters, have hundreds of thousands, maybe up to a million stars in them. Um, we don't quite understand how either type of cluster forms. Uh, globular clusters in particular, we don't know how you can get a million stars to form in such a dense ball like that all at once. Uh, these old stars are on the order of 13 billion years old. Now we know our universe now, our best estimate of the universe age is 13.7 billion years old. So these stars in M15 uh, formed very soon after our universe formed and were some of the first for stars to form in our galaxy. So our galaxy has about 150 globular clusters and thousands of open clusters. Um, and we study the evolution of how the stars work in each one. Now stars are born in nebulae. And nebulae are huge clouds of gas and dust in space. And gravity will pull those clouds together. And knots will get really, really dense. And really, really dense and denser. Until, at some point, nuclear fusion starts forming in the core of that dense clump of gas. And then a star is born. And then that star, um, once it's creating light, will push the rest of the dust around. So here we have dense gas. These black fingers are really dense gas and dust. And inside, stars are being formed. The bright stars are where the star has already been born and pushed the, the gas away. And uh, so M16 and M20, very similar types of uh, nebulae forming stars. Um, and the red color comes from hydrogen gas. Um, that's uh, excited and illuminated by the, the newborn stars. So we study this and try and understand exactly how stars are born. Uh, planetary nebulae. So this gets into how stars die. So um, it, certain types of stars, when they die, like our sun, in about five billion years, will die. It'll first become a red giant star. Stars, when they get old, turn into red giants. And then it'll puff off its outer atmosphere. And that makes this cloud of dust. Um, and, and here, the, the cloud of dust sort of fills, uh, and the dumbbell nebula, this cloud of dust sort of fills up the whole frame in the picture I've taken. Um, but the core of the star, like our sun, will collapse down into a white dwarf. And the white dwarf is at the exact center. So there's a white dwarf right there, white dwarf right here in the middle of the ring nebula. Um, that white dwarf is really hot, emits a lot of UV rays, um, also some optical, but mostly UV. And uh, that, that cloud of du gas is expanding outwards. And eventually, it will get so tenuous and so thin as it expands outward that you won't see it anymore. And you'll just be left with a naked white dwarf sitting there. And eventually, the white dwarf will cool down and eventually become a cold, dark lump of nothing after many, many billions of years. Uh, so that's one way a star can die. Uh, the next way a star can die is via a supernova explosion. And these are the biggest explosions we've seen in the universe. Um, when a supernova explosion happens, it looks like a bright new star. They're all usually so far away, you're not going to see the you know, details of the explosion. But it just looks really bright. So here's a picture of a galaxy before the supernova explosion. And then there is the supernova after it appeared. It looks like a bright new star. We have a robotic telescope on, on the top of Lick Observatory that looks for supernovae like this. In fact, this image came from that telescope, I believe. And, uh, and it looks at hundreds of galaxies a night, every night. And uh, when it thinks it sees a new supernova, it emails the team saying, I think I found a supernova, uh, which is pretty exciting when you discover a new one. It used to be 10 years ago that all the astronomers in the world would discover maybe two dozen supernova explosions in a year. Now this telescope we have at Lick Observatory discovers mm, on the order of one to two supernovae a week. So we're now discovering with one telescope more supernova explosions than all the rest of the world combined. Um, but a supernova explosion essentially happens when a big star, bigger than our sun, blows itself to bits at the end of its life. Um, there are actually two types of supernovae. Um, the type that, that I just talked about, the death of a star, is a type 2. Um, but uh, type 1 supernovae are when you have a white dwarf star, and it has a companion. And it dumps material. The, the, the the dying star dumps material onto the white dwarf, which is already a dead star. And when that hits 1.4 times the mass of our sun, physics has determined, has allowed us to figure out what this mass is, it goes kaboom and blows itself up into in a huge explosion. Uh, supernovae, um, they start out bright, being an explosion, and then they fade over many days to week and get less faint or, or less bright. And uh, so you know, we track these supernovae once we discover them at Lick Observatory and see uh, how, how, how quickly they fade. And uh, type 1a supernovae are great, or type 1s are great, 
because they always explode at 1.4 times the mass of our sun. That means they always have the same brightness. And so you can measure the brightness of that supernova. And if it's brighter, it means it's closer. If it's fainter, it means it's further away. So we can actually very accurately measure the distances to galaxies using supernova explosions, which uh, is pretty clever, I think, because it's really hard to measure distance of things in astronomy because you can't exactly lay out a uh, you know, measuring tape to uh, get from point A to point B. Um, accretion disk, this is what I was talking about with the type 1 supernovae. You have, in this case, it's a black hole. Sometimes at the end of a supernova, you end up with a black hole remnant. So this is one way of creating black holes. Um, and I study black holes, so um, you know, remember this accretion disk stuff. It'll come up later. Um, but uh, you can see here's a, here's a big star dumping material onto the black hole. It disappears at the core of the black hole, but every once in a while, some of the stuff gets slingshotted um, around the black hole, out along the poles, and creates these jets. Really, really um, fascinating stuff, and uh, not expected that you get jets from something that's sucking in material. Um, anyway, moving from stars and their lives and deaths, we're going to talk about extrasolar planets, um, which is planets around other stars. Now, this is an artist's conception by a, a friend of mine or a colleague of mine, Lynette Cook. Um, she is a space artist. Uh, but this is showing a planet moving in front of its parent star and blocking some of the light. This is one of the ways of discovering planets around other stars. It's not the way we do it at Lick Observatory. We actually um, discover planets uh, by looking at a star and seeing how the gravity of a planet causes a star to wobble back and forth. And that wobble is measurable. It's tiny. Most of it is this, uh, a few meters per second of wobble, um, which is you know, any of us walking can move you know, six feet a second. It's not hard. And that we can detect the wobble of a star that small due to a planet is pretty impressive. Um, we do this routinely at Lick Observatory. The team that works there, um, I think the next picture is, uh, yeah, was Deborah Fisher. She's one of the primary obs uh, observers. She uses a spectros uh, spectroscope there um, to, to look at the spectrum of the star. And you'll see little black lines of the spectrum. As the star moves towards us, those lines move to the blue. As they move away from us, they move to the red. And that wobbles. So she's tracking these little black lines as they wobble back and forth, teeny tiny bits to infer the presence of planets. We're not seeing the planets directly, but they're there. But this technique, they were the first ones to use it at Lick Observatory, and uh, it's proved incredibly successful. They've discovered about 2 thirds of the known planets around other stars uh, using Lick Observatory and, and our uh, companion observatory, Keck Observatory in Hawaii. Uh, now, there are about, at this time, 300 plus known planets around other stars. None of them are as small as Earth. We're really good, this technique is really good at discovering the really huge planets, like bigger than Jupiter. Uh, but we're building a new telescope at Lick Observatory that will, we hope, discover rocky Earth-sized planets that might, just might, harbor life. We don't know of life out there in the universe yet other than on Earth, but we're looking for it. But first, we've got to find the homes for them by looking at these extrasolar planets er, and discovering them. Um, now moving much further away, other galaxies. The Earth, the solar system, is one of many billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. There are similar galaxies throughout the universe, billions of galaxies, or as Carl would say, billions and billions of galaxies. Um, but uh, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. M101 is a pretty one. It's a spiral galaxy, very similar to our own galaxy. Spiral arms, stars are being formed in the spiral arms. Um, M102, sort of an edge-on view of the same sort of galaxy. Um, so depending on your viewing angle, you get very different looking things. Um, there are other types of galaxies out there, um, and they come in clusters. Uh, this big yellow thing in the middle of this HST picture is a huge giant elliptical galaxy. It doesn't have spiral arms like our own galaxy. It's sort of uniform, um, roughly kind of football shaped or oval shaped, um, egg shaped. Uh, but you'll see lots of other galaxies around it. And all these little galaxies are all part of the same cluster. They're all moving together through space. Um, and all gravitationally bound to each other. So uh, we study how the galaxies move inside clusters, how they interact with each other. Sometimes galaxies collide. It takes billions of years for galaxies to collide, so it's sort of a slow motion collision. But uh, we, we do study that and see how um, you know, d gas and dust and stars interact. Um, now at the centers of galaxies, you have supermassive black holes, or at least we think most galaxies have supermassive black holes. And this leads to what we call QSOs, or quasars, and AGN, active galactic, nu galactic nuclei. And these are the things I study. 
um, for my scientific work uh, for active galactic nuclei. So you can imagine, whoops, sorry. Um, you can imagine um, at the center of this galaxy is a supermassive black hole, like weighing a million times the mass of our sun, just huge. Stuff is getting sucked into it, gets hot, emits light because of friction and, and, and the heat. And then eventually some of that stuff actually gets sucked into the black hole, never to be seen again. Um, some of that stuff gets slingshotted out to create jets. So at the center of the galaxy M87, um, you see a jet of material that's being spewed out. These jets of material are really visible in the radio waves. So you want to use radio telescopes to look at them. Um, some of them are visible in the optical, like this one. That's sort of unusual. Um, but uh, you know, we've been trying to figure out what the jets are made of, how fast they're moving. Some of these jets appear to move faster than the speed of light. We know they aren't really, but it's a, it's a, 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 a weird optical illusion. Uh, so here's a little uh, diagram of how a uh, quasar works. You've got the massive black hole at the center, the accretion disk, which is the mirror getting stretched out and sucked into the uh, spiraling around the black hole. Um, outside a black hole, there might be just some clouds of gas and dust. And in fact, in the center of galaxies, they're, they're common that you'll have nebulae, these clouds. Um, and the light from the accretion disk actually illuminates those clouds and allows us to see them. And then you have those jets I was talking about before. So one of the things that I do in my research is try and measure just how massive that black hole is, try and do a census and figure out how, how big they are and where they are. Um, and this is sort of a cool animation that a theorist put together. Um, hello? Start moving. So this is showing, this is sort of looking at a black hole edge on. So you've got the accretion disk, sort of looks like a pancake from the side. And the material coming towards you is uh, red shifted, made it bluer in color, so it shows yellow there. Stuff moving away from you on the other side is being shifted into the infrared, where our eyes can't see it. And then the black hole's in the center, and uh, the, the gravity of the black hole actually bends light around it. So you can actually see the far side of this accretion disk you know, be the light being bent up over the black hole. It's really bizarre um, that gravity is strong enough that it bends light waves and acts like a lens that allows us to see things we wouldn't otherwise be able to see. We see this gravitational lensing. It was predicted by Einstein's uh, theory of relativity. Uh, we can use it to actually look, we could use this effect um, to actually view galaxies much further away that would otherwise be invisible. But the light is bent uh, so that we can't see it. Hello. So I've now talked to, given you a very short tour of the universe um, and all the various, well, not all the various types of objects, but a lot of them. Um, you see there's a lot to, to out there. Um, but this is a picture of me in front of the three meter telescope with one of the coolest instruments I helped build, which is this massive laser shooting out of the dome. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit later why this laser is useful for astronomy. Um, but one of the main parts of my job, probably the biggest part of my job, is designing high tech image I instruments for to use to look at the universe in new ways. Every time you figure out a new way to look at the new universe, you discover new things. Um, and I think the next thing is a picture of Claire Max. She's the lady who actually is the head of this project. Um, and and so, so she's really the true pioneer uh, in this uh, field called adaptive optics. Um, now adaptive optics is a technology we use for viewing at the sky. Um, all of us have seen twinkling scars, stars in the sky. Very pretty, very bad for astronomy. Twinkling stars is caused by turbulence in the atmosphere. Um, it's kind of like trying to bird watch from the bottom of the swimming pool. The, the swimming pool wave action blurs everything you're looking at above it. Earth's atmosphere sort of works the same way. So that no matter how big your telescope, you're not gonna see all the details because of the wobbly atmosphere. Adaptive optics, we measure the turbulence, the wobble in the atmosphere, and correct it in real time. So we end up with nice, sharp images. You could do the same thing by sending a satellite up into space, but sending a satellite up into space is hideously expensive. Adaptive optics is not cheap, but it's not like trying to send up a, a, a satellite into space. Um, so what we do is on the order of a thousand times a second, we look at a really bright star in the direction we want to look with our telescope, and we measure how that star is being blurred. And then, in real time, we calculate that and send a signal to a deformable mirror. Um, essentially, it's a, 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 essentially a, a thin glass mirror with little pistons on the back of it that pushes and pulls the mirror to change its shape. So we put equal but opposite turbulence on the mirror as what we measure in the sky. 
Um, and this animation will show you pretty much how that works. Yes, it's running. Okay, so here we're opening up the dome for the telescope. We've got the telescope inside. Um, we point the telescope at whatever star we want to look at. And then the light comes through the telescope, down to the back, and then we have our instrument. And this will be a little cutaway view of our adaptive optics instrument. So first we get the light from the telescope and comes through here, hits a mirror, goes through here. Red light will go to our camera. Blue light goes to what's the wavefront sensor. This is the thing that detects the turbulence. And why does this, okay. And then you can see our wobbly image of the star here. That's all the Earth's atmosphere blurring it out. And you will see in a moment here, I call this a potato chip movie. You'll see why in a second. <laughs> we have all the wobbly images of the star from, you know, blurred from the Earth's atmosphere coming through the system and just bouncing off the mirror and we get blurry images. Now, if we start detecting the turbulence with the wavefront sensor, it goes through and starts changing the shape of your mirror putting equal but opposite turbulence on it. And all of a sudden, you end up with nice, you know, flat tortillas, I like to say. Um, but this is the corrected light. We've removed all the wobbliness from the atmosphere and um, do that and, and, and corrected it all. So now when we look at our image, we should get a nice pinpoint of light that's nice and stable. So this allows us to take advantage of the full size of our telescope. Um, if we didn't have adaptive optics, we'd end up with a big fuzzy blob. Without, with adaptive optics, we end up with images, at least on the three meter telescope at Lick Observatory, sharper than the Hubble Space Telescope. The bigger the telescope, the sharper your image is with adaptive optics. So the Keck Telescope, which is 10 meters in diameter, not three meters in diameter, gives you, you know, much better images than the Hubble Space Telescope. Lick Observatory, three meter telescope, just a little bit better than the Hubble Space Telescope. So this technology is really tough to build. But it works. Um, here is some actual data I took with the three meter telescope. And let's get the movie running. So you can see without adaptive optics, you know, your images are jumping around, blurry. You can't really tell the difference between the top one and the bottom one. But with adaptive optics looking, working, you can see there, single star. The second one, double star. And in fact, I've been monitoring this star and actually watching the one star go around the other to calculate its orbit. So it's a very powerful technique allows us to see the universe in much more detail than we would otherwise be able to look at. And as I said, this is you know, higher resolution, finer images than you would get with the Hubble Space Telescope. Oops, wrong way. Come on. Oops, shoot. There we go. So adaptive optics, being the instrument uh, geek that I am, um, this is what the actual system looks like, the real hardware. It's big. <laughs> um, that's me up to the side. And uh, you know, we've got the light comes from the telescope here to the top, bounces through off a lot of optics. This is our deformable mirror. That's the thing that's changing shape a thousand times a second to correct for the turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, light is detected down here to measure the turbulence with the wavefront sensor. Um, this blue box right here is the camera. That's the science camera that takes the pretty pictures. So this is what the astronomers, they want to use this camera, get their pretty pictures, look at their science, discover new things. Um, so this is where it sits on the telescope, sits on the bottom of the telescope, just like in the animation. Uh, this is a previous incarnation. We've rebuilt it, so it looks a little different on the bottom, but it's the same concept. But we have a problem. There aren't bright stars everywhere in the sky, so you can measure the turbulence. In fact, only 1%, less than 1% of the sky is near a bright star where you can measure the turbulence. Because it's very nice if you measure the turbulence over there, but the turbulence is going to be different over there. So if you look at that star, you can't look at something over there if it's not near a bright star. So in astronomy, we've gotten clever. We, dis we discovered that we could use a laser to create a fake star wherever we needed it. Um, using the laser is really cool. It really does look like this. It's like a huge lightsaber coming right out of the dome. Um, one of the coolest things you'll probably ever see if you're ever at Lick Observatory when we're using it. Um, and it's great because we can create a fake star wherever we need it, do the same measurements, use this technique. Um, logistically, it's a little tough. It's a powerful laser. It's about 20 watts of laser power. This laser pointer I'm using here is about half a milliwatt. So it's many thousands of times more powerful than this laser pointer, um, which means if an airplane is flying by, we don't want to hit it. We're not going to blow up the airplane, <laughs> but you could blind the pilot. Um, it's like those green laser pointers that they, they sell in the stores nowadays. Don't ever shine those at an airplane. That could dazzle the pilot, cause similar problems. It's also illegal to shine lasers at uh, aircraft. Uh, so I have to work with FAA. Um, also turns out a lot of this laser light we send out goes right through the Earth's atmosphere and uh, 
can uh, blind downward looking satellites or astronauts eyes. So I get to talk to US Space Command and let them know when we're using our laser so they can tell me when not to use it so I don't hit an, a satellite or an astronaut. Um, but it's a really cool technique. So here is using the laser. Uh, this is some data taken by a colleague of mine, Andrea Gez, um, with the Keck telescope showing, whoops, that was not what I wanted to happen. Hello. Oh, there we go. So this is showing with, without adaptive optics, the blurry image you get, and then you turn on the system, and look at all these faint little stars in that box that you'd see absolutely nothing. But then as soon as the adaptive optics turns on, let it play again. You'll, you'll see, hello, it's not playing again. Technology, sometimes it doesn't work the way you intend. Well, I hope you all saw it the first time, where you saw a bunch of little faint little stars show up out of nothing. Um, so in the Keck telescope, I mean, this is many, many times better than you would ever be able to get with the, the um, Hubble Space Telescope. Well, I think I'll have to give up on that one, because it's running out of time. So what about my own research? As I said, I look at quasars, these supermassive black holes at the cores of galaxies. Well, this is a galaxy I looked at. And uh, without adaptive optics, you wouldn't be able to see this galaxy at all. With adaptive optics, I can see the size of the galaxy. There's a correlation between the size of the galaxy and the mass of the black hole. So I've measured the black hole at the center of this galaxy to weigh about one billion times the mass of our sun, one of the biggest black holes ever discovered. Um, also, as a bonus, I discovered these two little galaxies right next to it. Now, every time we use a new tool, you discover new things. Um, so here's another galaxy I observed. Again, it, this one didn't have quite as massive of a black hole, only about 300 million times the mass of our sun, or about one third the mass of the previous one. But this one also had a companion galaxy. So you know, as, as it turns out that many of these massive galaxies that have black holes in them are actually in clusters of galaxies, not just sitting off on their own. And so you know, benefit of my research is discovering these new uh, galaxies. And I won't go over all the mathematical details there. But those galaxies are on the order of six or seven billion light years away from us. They're very far away. Uh, so that we can see with that detail and discover new things is pretty impressive. Um, so now that we have this great technology, you know, this big instrument, we want to actually make it smaller, miniaturize it, use it on more telescopes. So um, this is my colleague, Brian Grigsby, also works at Lick Observatory. I hired him to help me out with adaptive optics. And uh, this is an adaptive optics system he's standing next to vastly smaller. We're using some new technologies uh, called MEMS mirrors, which are essentially silicon chip devices to do the same thing as um, what our bigger system is doing. And uh, so you can see, this thing is much smaller. In fact, we also use adaptive optics in uh, clinical offices or, or eventually um, to look at people's eyeballs, because it turns out your eyeball is always moving and the material inside your eye is uh, turbulent. And we can get it better images of your retina by using adaptive optics. So if we can make something miniaturized, then it's something that conceivably we could put in, say, a doctor's office. But uh, you know, once we miniaturize stuff like this, make it more robust, cheaper, cheaper to make these newer systems. Uh, instead of a million dollars, it's like $100,000. Uh, price is going to only come down as time goes on. Um, but we hope to use them on, say, big new telescopes. Like this is the 30 meter telescope uh, planned. It's, you know, think of the size of a base, something the size of a baseball diamond, staring around and looking at the sky. Truly huge telescope. Um, it's going to use multiple laser guide stars. It's going to use adaptive optics. Um, that's the only way you could fully take advantage of a telescope this large. And so this is where the technology I'm working on is going. And with luck, it will give us even new and exciting views of the universe that we haven't had before. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I ran through a lot of things really fast, too. <laughs> Right.
Yes. Okay. One more question. Given the distances we're talking about, uh, do you presume or do you imagine that we would ever approach even the, the, the Milton star to our uh, I mean, given the, 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 the speed at which we get to some of these stations right now, we're talking the Milton star four light years away. Right. What, 300,000 years as a facing star? So what is the reality? It's, it's, it's one of those things that, that basic space travel, yeah, the distances are huger than people want to um, realize. You know, Star Trek makes it all seem very close. Unless we have a fundamental um, discovery in physics, figuring out how to fold space or travel faster than the speed of light, which does seem to be the, internet, you know, the, the universal speed limit, nothing goes faster than light, um, we're kind of trapped at, uh, you know, snailing our way to the nearby stars, which would take, you know, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years just to get to the nearest star to us outside of our solar system. Yeah, so that's would be a fundamental, it would be a great discovery, may yet happen, but we certainly don't have the physics today, and it, and it may just not be possible. Welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, we, we do find, the problem is, is that there are two types of supermassive black holes. There are ones that are actively sucking in material, and there are ones that there's not enough material around them to have anything sucked in. The ones that don't have anything getting sucked in, we can't see, because we can't see the black holes themselves. We can only see the effects they have on material around them, uh, because they're black holes. They, 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 suck in all, uh, they suck in everything, including light. Um, what we do see, weirdly enough, is that the further away you get, which means the earlier in the universe you're looking, um, we see many more active black holes. And so if it's active, we can measure its mass. If it's not active, we don't see it, we can't measure its mass. So in the near universe, like our neighboring galaxies and stuff, we don't, one, we don't know if there is a black hole at the core. We suspect there is at every large galaxy, but we don't know, um, and two, when did they stop sucking in material? When did the neighborhood uh, you know, run dry? And why is it more stuff getting sucked in you know, as, as orbits decay around, you know, from all the material in the galaxies? Because the galaxies are rich with stuff. So you know, we don't know the answers yet. And that's some of my research. Is, you know, my research right now is just doing a census. But it is leading towards answering some of these other questions. Yeah. Okay, the, the difference between a star and a planet is really pretty basic. A star generates its own light via nuclear fusion in the core. So there's an energy source at the core of the star that then propagates out to the surface and, gener and, and emits light. Now the planets don't do that. They don't have nuclear fusion going on at their cores. Um, and so planets like the Earth, like Jupiter, they're not emitting their own light uh, via nuclear fusion. Uh, so, so that um, you, you just have, um, you know, just it's, it's rock or gas, but it's not inherently luminous. Um, when a star dies, there's a remnant like a white dwarf that's hot, because you've all seen like heating coils on a stove be emit light because they're hot, um, but eventually it cools down. But there's no nuclear fusion going on in the core, so it's not really a star. It's sort of a remnant. Um, Pluto still exists. It didn't go away as a planet. It just got reclassified. Instead of being a planet, is now a dwarf planet. Uh, so that's a different thing. Um, I hope I answered questions in a reasonable way. <laughs> so if not, we could talk later some more. <laughs> yeah. Um, because of the distance away from the stars, we're basically looking at history, are we not? Yes, we are. Yeah, we don't see anything as it happens today. Even my looking at you, I'm seeing you as you were, you know, many tiny fractions of a second ago because it takes a finite amount of time for the light to travel from where you are to where I am. So yeah, I like to think of telescopes as actually really big time machines. The further away something is, the further ago you're seeing it in the past. And so we actually can look at 
the history of the universe by looking, you know, we can see what happened in the early universe by looking at very, very distant objects. And so that's why we know as much about the history of the universe as we do, is because the speed of light is finite. I don't know if it was visible with the naked eye, but certainly we do have close calls with asteroids on a fairly regular basis. You know, every few years one comes between the Earth and the Moon, and the Moon's only a quarter million miles away. So, so strafing runs like that do happen. Um, we have programs out there to try and discover these asteroids that might make, give us close calls, um, but they're hard to see because they're small and faint. They aren't emitting their own light, so they're, they're big chunks of rock. They're hard to see. Uh, but we do have programs to detect them. Uh, but we miss them. We're not perfect. <laughs> yeah? Ooh, hundreds of thousands probably. We have about 100,000 that have been discovered and have well-defined orbits. Um, and any minor planet that has an orbit that's well-defined is eligible to be named. Um, so when I had an asteroid named after me, it was, you know, there were only like 5,000 that were classified like that. But of course, over the intervening two decades, um, you know, there's been a lot of advances in technology and tracking and finding these things. So there are more. So, but I suspect, you know, there are lots of small ones. You know, when do, when do you just call it a small rock versus an asteroid? Um, <laughs> it's a size thing. Um, and I don't think we have any firm limits. Well, minor planets are a, gen, a, a more general classification. Minor planets include asteroids and comets. Um, and then we have dwarf planets, which are bigger than asteroids, uh, but not so big as the major planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Earth. Uh, so yeah, it's all classification. There's sort of this long continuum of mass and shape. Uh, so it's, it's, we set arbitrary boundaries. <laughs> I am familiar with it. I believe it's by Brian Green, but I have not read it. Um, I don't deal with anything about string theory myself. Um, string theory, yeah. Yeah, string theory is is um, not verified by any um, physical facts yet. So it's, it's really more, an, it's a hypothesis really, not a theory, because theories actually presuppose that there's some facts to back them up. Um, but it does explain a bunch of things, it's just we need some testable uh, uh, things so the observationalists like myself can go to work and see if it's really true or not. So you had a question? <coughs> mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm sure people have thought about it. That's, that's more with the, the, the geophysicists and, and, and atmospheric scientists. Um, one of my colleagues is actually looking, uh, Lick Observatory has been in existence for 120 years. We have data looking at the atmosphere over most of that period. And she's actually looking through, um, Elizabeth Griffin's actually looking at these old data to see how the abundance of ozone has changed in the Earth's atmosphere over the past 120 years. So we have the information, it just hasn't been analyzed yet, to at least see what the trends are. It's the only large galaxy coming towards us. Um, the expansion of the universe from the Big Bang, the origin of the universe, it means that, you know, mo for the most part, things are moving away from us. But on smaller spatial scales, things that are closer to us, the local gravity is dominant over the expansion of the universe. And so Andromeda Galaxy and the Milky Way Galaxy are in the same local group. They're gravitationally bound towards each other. And in fact, we're headed on a collision course. On the order of something like two billion years, the Andromeda Galaxy and the, the Milky Way Galaxy will collide. Um, you know, we won't be around to see it, but it'll be spectacular when it happens. <laughs> so, but I hope that answers your question. The gravity is dominant on smaller scales. Anything else? Yeah. Um, 
we think most big galaxies and spiral galaxies tend to be big galaxies. There's a black hole at the center. Yep, we have, we have that. In, in fact, uh, Andrea Gaz, one of my colleagues, um, she actually has measured the mass of the black hole at the center of our galaxy using adaptive optics, this technology I helped develop. Um, so that she actually looked at stars orbiting around the black hole. And we've measured the black hole of the center of our galaxy to be on the order of a million times the mass of our sun. So it's a big black hole, but not among the, the largest. Nope. It's, it's what we call quiescent. It's not, it's not sucking in enough stuff for us to see the stuff around it. Yeah. Oh, we just don't know. Doesn't know. One of you might be an astronomer in the future and figure it out. <laughs> Don't we wish we knew? <laughs> the theorists have all sorts of theories. Some theorists say that you get inside a black hole and time-like dimensions become space-like, enabling uh, time travel. Um, you know, it, it, there are all sorts of different theories. We can't see inside a black hole. There's no physics that allows us to do that. So we're kind of guessing. So we don't know. You had another question? OK. Formation of our moon? Um, we believe our moon was formed when a large body, say the size of Mars, hit the Earth early on in its history, before the Earth was fully solid. It was still hot and kind of molten. And that sort of flung off a big chunk of the Earth that then started orbiting around the main part of the Earth and solidified to become the moon. That's the current prevailing explanation. It may not be 100% correct, but we, we think it's pretty good. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for coming today. <laughs>